This is Lecture 2 for Class 2. Last week, we reviewed the different types of primary authority. This week, we are going to talk about secondary authority. Secondary authority consists of commentary about the law, written by law professors and expert practitioners. Secondary authority exists in degrees of importance or levels of persuasiveness. It is always persuasive, but the degree of persuasiveness changes depending on the resource, the author, and the reason why you are citing to it. You are not always able to cite to secondary authority in your briefs simply because it is not persuasive enough. It's more of a research tool. Like primary authority, secondary authority can exist in print, online, or both formats. This does not affect its level of persuasiveness. You have already had a glimpse of how to find secondary authority through annotated codes from the previous lecture when we looked at the USCA. All annotated statutes will refer you to a variety of research aids. Remember on Westlaw Next you can find secondary authority by clicking on citing references when viewing a statute and then filtering on the left. Finding secondary authority from a primary authority is often a preferred and efficient research technique that we'll be practicing in class. Commentary about the law is subject driven, so it's not always limited by jurisdiction the way primary authority is limited. A secondary authority on contract law is likely to be as relevant in Hawaii as it is in California. However, a secondary authority on federal civil procedure will only be relevant when working with federal courts, not state courts. Examples of commentary that you will come into contact with in your first year of law school includes restatements of law, treatises, articles, annotations, encyclopedias, and dictionaries. And I will briefly review these sources in order of their depth of treatment and level of persuasiveness. A restatement of law is usually a multi-volume review of an area of law written by a group of experts. Restatements are highly valued by practitioners and judges. Consider this two-sentence restatement on conditional promises serving as adequate consideration to form a contract. These two statements represent thousands of judicial opinions which informed the authors of this rule. In addition to this clearly stated rule, every entry provides a note explaining the rule, shows you how to apply it using hypotheticals, and then provide citations to cases that address it organized by jurisdiction. After reading the rule, you would then start exploring the case law relevant to your jurisdiction. Do you remember what your jurisdiction is here in Hawaii? Do you remember what jurisdiction is at all? If not, you better look it up again. There are only 35 restatements, which means that there isn't a restatement for every legal topic. The topics that are covered are listed on the screen. The subjects relevant to your first year of law school are starred. You should consult them if you are confused about a legal issue discussed in your classes or textbooks. The restatements in the library are located across from the Dole Street windows and can be found along range number 38. This is a difficult set of books to update and use in print, and I recommend using the Westlaw Next version of it to acquire the most recent version of any particular section. To do this, select secondary sources from the main screen, and then look for Restatements and Principles of the Law. From here, you can select the title that is suitable for your research. If we want to go back and visit Contracts, we see that there is a restatement first and a restatement second. The restatement first was the first series. The second is the current series. So let's select that. Here you'll see a table of contents which orients you to the set of books. You can scroll through the table of contents to find the topic that you're interested in reading about. For example, the requirement of consideration. And from here, you can maneuver to the particular section you want to research. Section 76, Conditional Promise, was what we looked at in the print version. The next type of secondary authority I want to review is a treatise. 
A treatise is a scholarly commentary on the law in a particular subject group. These resources tend to be an in-depth and thorough analysis of the law for a defined subject area. Think of a treatise as having a lawyer with a special expertise in this area of law explaining it to you. For example, Williston's A Treatise on the Law of Contracts. Every lawyer who took a contracts class knows this publication and continues to refer to it during their careers. To use a treatise, you can browse a table of contents in the front of the book, or if you have something specific to look up, you can use an index. Treatises on Westlaw Next can be found under Secondary Sources. On the next screen, you would click on Texts and Treatises. The treatises are organized by topic as well as by jurisdiction. The very popular ones are listed on top for easy access. If you're looking for a contracts treatise, on Westlaw Next, contracts is organized under commercial law. When you open up one of the topic areas, you'll see the treatises represented on Westlaw Next listed alphabetically by title. We can scroll down and open Williston on contracts. When you open a treatise on Westlaw Next, you're confronted with a table of contents and an index off to the right-hand side, and you would use them differently. If you want to review an area within contracts, you would browse the table of contents and look for that area. For example, Chapter 7 on Consideration. However, if you have something specific that you want to read about, you would use the index. For example, if we wanted to see conditional promises and what the treatise has to say on this specific issue, we can use that as a keyword search in the index and then we're presented with a result list where conditional promises are discussed in a variety of contexts. In the law library, the treatises are also organized by subject. For example, Williston's is found in range 13, along with other contracts materials. All contract materials have a spine number around KF801. If you look at your library map, you will see KF801 books are found along range 13. All subject areas have different call numbers. You can ask one of our research assistants, your professor, or another librarian to help you find a treatise on your subject in the library. Articles that you will read are usually published in law reviews or law journals. Law reviews and journals are publications that are produced by law schools, bar associations, and some commercial publishers. The articles are narrowly focused on discrete aspects of an area of law, and they are heavily footnoted. In law school, you will read a lot of law journal articles. Many of them can be found through your Westlaw Next account by conducting a keyword search, but we like to recommend a service called Hein Online for law journals. To access this database, go to the library's webpage and select Hein Online under the research links. There's a lot of different content on Hein Online, but we're interested in the law journal library. A reason that we like to use Hein Online is because it has more law journals than Westlaw Next. You can conduct keyword searches from the Law Journal Library by entering your keywords in this box. If you have a citation, you can use the Citation Navigator and enter your citation directly. Another reason we like using Hein is because the journals are represented in PDF format. This makes them easier to read than the journals on Westlaw Next, and they are much easier to cite to. When you retrieve your results, you can download them or manipulate them by using these tools on the upper right-hand side. I'm also going to point out this feature. You see where it says Cited by 12 Articles? Hein will tell you about other articles that cite back to this article. This is a useful research tool because it can advance your own research. Here you're seeing other articles that are talking about the same subject. Encyclopedias and dictionaries are much shorter treatments that typically focus on particular phrases or situations that lawyers frequently encounter. 
This is a great way to start your research, particularly if you don't know what area of law you should be looking at. This entry on what constitutes consideration is from the encyclopedia Corpus Juris Secundum, or CJS. It is a nice, concise, one-page description of what constitutes consideration. One exception to this category of short and to-the-point entries is a publication called the American Law Reports, or ALR for short. This publication contains lengthy essays on discrete areas of law and often has rather quirky but practical discussions. These essays are called annotations. For example, consider this annotation on the adequacy of the resumption of marital relations as consideration to form a valid contract. Definitely quirky, but also very useful and practical. If you find an ALR annotation on your topic, much of your research will already be done and you'll only need to update it. That's why we always recommend check the ALRs to see if someone has already done your research for you. American Law Reports have essays on international, federal, and state law topics. The jurisdictions are separated into ALR International, ALR Federal, and then the state topics which are represented in series beginning with the original ALR and continuing to ALR 6th. It's important to know which version of the ALR you are citing to for Blue Book purposes. The American Law Report series are extremely valuable research tools, but you should not be citing to them in your briefs. Remember that most of these resources we've discussed have a table of contents to help orient you to the publication in the front of the book and a detailed index for more precise inquiries at the end of the book, such as these indexes for the American Law Reports. If you're on Westlaw Next, the index to publication is on the right side of the screen. To use an index, you would just search using words that describe what you are looking for trying to be as precise as possible and thinking of different ways to express your topic. When you're thinking about words that are important to conduct research, be as descriptive as possible. Think of synonyms, and it's okay to use a thesaurus. When you start your research, begin with the most discrete term and work your way out to the most general. Let's think for a moment about a situation where you have a client who is bitten by her friend's pet ferret. Think about the different ways you can describe bite and the different ways you can describe a ferret. Look at these words and which ones are more specific. Those are the ones they're going to start with. Keep in mind that your words might change as you do more research and learn more about your case. They might expand or contract or change completely. For example, you might learn that a ferret is not a rodent, but it belongs to the weasel family instead. All of these secondary authority resources are useful to a researcher, but you may prefer one over another depending on your task at hand. For example, if you need a thorough understanding of a practice area, you'll probably lean toward finding a good treatise. It will bring together many concepts within that subject and cite you to case law as well as statutory law. If, on the other hand, you are tracking down a judicial doctrine in a common law area, you're more likely to consult a restatement. Regardless of which resource you are using, you must always be vigilant about evaluating it. How relevant is it? Who wrote it? What are their credentials? Do they have a bias? Does it affect the veracity of the material? Is the material current, and does it matter if it's current? Well, we have something to help you get used to making this analysis. It is called the CRAP test. Yes, that's right, the CRAP test. Let me take you back to our research guide on authority. If we revisit authority resources for law, and this time we look at the second tab here, you'll see the CRAP test and you'll see that through this analysis you can assign points to the material that you're evaluating. The higher the number of points, 
the better the material is. You should be using this for your homework and when you encounter new resources that you're unfamiliar with. To make it easy to use, we've provided a PDF version of it so you can download it to your own computer. Secondary authority exists in many forms. Some forms are more authoritative than others. You will often be referenced to a resource from another resource, whether it's secondary or primary. Regardless, you should always be questioning the accuracy, validity, and reliability of the resource. If the commentary on the same topic seems different to you, it's your job to track down why, which is correct, which is not correct. This concludes Lecture 2 for Class 2.